Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first house talk of 2021. Um, we have a real treat for you today. Uh, founding director Dr. Marcia Bellisciano will be speaking about Benjamin Franklin and the art of diplomacy. So welcome. Thank you very much, Caitlin, and I am delighted to be delivering this talk today. Um, I will be looking forward to the questions um, that you might have and, and the dialogue that we can have, because I know many of you are uh, as aware of Benjamin Franklin as uh, we are at Benjamin Franklin House. Um, but I thought it would be an interesting conversation today around the art of diplomacy, because we tend to know lots of things about Benjamin Franklin, his work in science, and his role as a founder of the United States. But I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit more to the topic of diplomacy. So if we go on, Caitlin. That's a picture of Benjamin Franklin House, which is currently closed because of our COVID restrictions here in the UK. But we are very excited to be reopening uh, the week of the 17th of May, so just a few weeks um, more to go, and we'll be opening on the Friday of that week, um, and that will be a very important day uh, as we get back into the house and welcome the public once again. We uh, do three things at Benjamin Franklin House. So we have as our main public offering our museum as theater historical experience, and you can learn more about that on our website at uh, benjaminfranklinhouse.org and also on Bloomberg Connects. We are delighted to be a partner of Bloomberg and on Bloomberg Connects, which you can download from any app store, you can see more information about the historical experience. It's really a piece of theater that runs through the spaces because we were thinking that uh, many places have amazing artifacts of Benjamin Franklin, and we have a few, but because the house had never been open to the public before, we opened on the triumphant 300th birthday of Benjamin Franklin on the 17th of January, 2006, we had not really amassed a, a collection. And, and so there are wonderful places you can go like Franklin Court in Philadelphia, run by the US National Park Service to see lots of great things uh, that they have. But what we have is the story and what you're looking at on the screen now. This is the largest existing artifact related to Benjamin Franklin. We also have a very vibrant uh, educational program and reach out to uh, school children free of charge and to schools. And we have a wonderful house team. Caitlin is our operations manager and, and we all multitask and we have a wonderful education manager um, as well, Eleanor Hamblin. And the third thing that we do is really this. Um, it is using the intellectual capital around Benjamin Franklin to have uh, good conversations. So if we go on, There's a picture of Benjamin Franklin. It's the Duplessis portrait of him. It's probably my favorite. I love the, the um, humanity that I see in his face, the warmth, um, and also as if he's maybe uh, not too far away from a smile. So when I was beginning to think about uh, this talk, I wanted to look up in the source that is uh, where you go when you wanna find out anything about Benjamin Franklin, the papers of Benjamin Franklin that are cataloged by Yale University. Uh, Yale has been at this uh, since the 1950s and there's still more work to be done. These are the papers that relate to Franklin's own writings, things that were written to him that were contemporary or written about him from the contemporary period as well. So, it allows you to do lots of interesting things like look up how many times Franklin used a particular word. So given that I called this talk the art of diplomacy, when I looked in the papers of Benjamin Franklin, I found, you'll be surprised to know, not a single reference to the word diplomacy. So then I thought I would try diplomat. And again, there was nothing. But what there was, um, thinking laterally, 
for the word negotiation, there were 238 references. So I began to think about what made Benjamin Franklin a good diplomat and you know, how did that career really begin? And I think it relates to something of his personality. A year ago at the beginning of lockdown, I gave a talk on Benjamin Franklin and his 13 virtues. These 13 virtues were his way of a self-improvement program where he focused on one of these 13 for a week at a time, and then he would move on to the next one and try to concentrate on that next one for a full week, with the idea being that the intensive focus on an individual uh, virtue would actually help him to incorporate these virtues in his life as a matter of, of course, that he would just, it would become second nature to, uh, to him to be a kind of virtuous person. But one of the things we know about Benjamin Franklin is that, well, he wasn't an orator. His power, as we like to say at Benjamin Franklin House, was his pen. He, as part of not really focusing on the power of the spoken word, he didn't necessarily contradict people. That wasn't his way. He really believed in the Socratic method of engaging, asking questions, because he realized he had uh, quite a bit of emotional intelligence, we might say today, that if you uh, actively challenge someone, you get their hackles up and you may not get a really good response and people stop listening when they're feeling under pressure or threatened. So Franklin had a, a, a different uh, approach that he learned to hone. Now, how he was as a very young man, and Eleanor uh, gave a talk about young Benjamin Franklin last year, may be different from the person that he evolved into because of course he ran away from home. He was apprenticed, came from this uh, large family, apprenticed to his brother James, who had a printing press and was running a newspaper and really chafed under his brother's watchful eye and James's reluctance to let his uh, younger brother shine. So Franklin had had enough at a certain point and actually went away to make his own fortune in the world and ends up in Philadelphia. So he, how were his uh, tactics as a peacemaker, as a teenager, uh, we, we can only guess, but certainly um, when I went to the Bible of Benjamin Franklin, so there are so many wonderful um, books on, on Franklin, and we are delighted that many of them are part of uh, the authors, part of our academic advisory group. Uh, there are people like great friends of the house, Walter Isaacson, uh, and I commend his book to you on Benjamin Franklin. Uh, it's written in such a, a readable style and really makes the, the overall story quite fresh. Uh, you have our uh, author in residence at Benjamin Franklin House, um, George Goodwin, who's wrote, who's written about Benjamin Franklin's time in London. And also we're incredibly excited that our Lady Joan Reed children's author in residence has her new book. It's just going to be hot off the press from the American Philosophical Society, which was started by Benjamin Franklin, this place for, for learning and sharing. And it is uh, today one of the most distinguished academic um, uh, gathering points for, for people um, who are scholars studying all sorts of uh, things. But um, Professor Sarah Pomeroy is our children's author in residence uh, named after Lady Joan Reed who was our house historian uh, during the, the years that she was with us and, and prior to her passing back, I think in 2017. So uh, Sarah's new book is actually written for young adults and that is um, Benjamin Franklin's Swimmer. So it's looking at that aspect of his life. So please watch for that. And Sarah's actually going to be giving a talk for us um, in a few weeks time. And she'll be interviewed by the great American journalist, Lynn Schur, so you won't want to miss that. But my Bible of Benjamin Franklin, here it is. It's very well thumbed, um, and it's by Carl Van Doren. And he won the Pulitzer Prize 
um, in the 1930s for this book. And I thought that it was quite interesting that after Benjamin Franklin had had his first stint in London, so he goes off to Philadelphia, he takes an interest in setting up his own press, he meets the then governor of uh, Pennsylvania who thinks that Franklin shows some promise and if he really wants to learn about the printing trade, he should go to London. He offers to finance his journey, but no money is ever forthcoming. But Franklin decides to go anyway. And he learns a lot about printing, but he also learns a lot about life. We don't know where uh, William, his son's mother, was located. Um, was she in uh, London or somewhere else, but we know that during this period um, gives gives rise to the birth of um, it would give rise to the birth of his illegitimate son uh, William Franklin. So he comes back to uh, Philadelphia and he is able to eventually transfer the learning that he gained in London um, about the printing trade and he buys out um, uh, maybe a failing newspaper, he sets up his own press, and as a very young man, um, he's, he's on his way. And in this quote by um, Van Doren, he says that um, by the 1730s, that um, Franklin's life drew gradually together in the single broad stream, which was his character moving through history. Uh, he had investigated his own mind till he knew it and was at home there. So uh, certainly from the perspective of Van Doren, Franklin as a young man um, is developing a temperament that would be well suited uh, to diplomacy. One of the, the challenges that Franklin uh, as a, a would-be diplomat was tasked with undertaking was uh, in the French and Indian War which as we know was a kind of proxy war between the British and the French. The French were allied with Native American forces uh, and the French were loath to let too much territory cede to the British and there were tensions uh, as they each tried to lay their claim to this uh, new world land. And Franklin had a great success, as we know, as a, as a printer and publisher, he had what became the colonial equivalent to a bestseller in Poor Richard's Almanac. And he was able to print all kinds of things, came up with ideas around currency. Uh, his newspaper was a great success as well. Um, he began um, working on ideas for delivering the post. And that was also quite useful as a way of, instead of coming in to pick up your mail from a single source, actually sending it out. And that was a great distribution channel for his, uh, his newspaper. But he gradually began to think after a number of years, keeping his head down and uh, running his business and also engaging in a number of civic activities. He established the Junto, his network of friends that were very much focused on sharing best practice around personal development. Uh, he created the seeds of what would become the one of the early universities in America, um, today's University of Pennsylvania, uh, one of the first hospitals, the Pennsylvania Hospital, the first lending library, um, today the um, library company of Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Contributionship, uh, first insurance company, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's what makes him so famous, uh, certainly for Americans and uh, for which he is, is very much revered. But he, he had a passion for science. And he also had a passion for politics. So he becomes a clerk initially to the Pennsylvania Assembly, and then he becomes an elected official. And uh, uh, one of the, the stories um, that is quite interesting is that uh, Franklin is chosen by the legislature to be one of the negotiators uh, with um, the Indians that are um, in part of the incursions um, and 
there's a feeling um, that uh, with some good negotiation with the Native Americans that they can re maybe retreat or, or um, not be such a cause of concern. And uh, here I'm going to, to read to you from Van Doren again. Um, he, he talks about how um, Franklin, he's negotiating um, with uh, the Iroquois Confederation uh, among others, but uh, he, he's noting that these, the Native American population, that there's six different Native American uh, nations that were able to come together in a kind of uh, a union to uh, be able to advance their interests in a collaborative way. And uh, he thought that if, if they could do it, then why couldn't 13 colonies uh, achieve something along those lines, which would help with their mutual defense. At this point, while there have been tensions uh, with the, the crown and parliament, the, the tensions that ultimately boil over into the Revolutionary War are, are yet to come. And Franklin, when he is uh, serving in his position, various positions in Philadelphia prior to going to London in 1757 for the second time, and in a much different capacity as the most famous colonial of his day, he is uh, very much uh, the um, person who is uh, considered to be able to uh, negotiate in a way that can um, bring about a, a positive reconciliation for, for what is desired. And at, at this point, he thinks of himself, uh, as do almost every colonist, as a member of the British Empire and, to, and as a British American. His father was born in Epton in Northamptonshire before he moved to Boston. And his mother was born on the island of Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts. So he's, uh, he very much is of uh, two worlds, but they think of themselves as loyal subjects of the crown. But at this time, uh, he says that uh, Van Doren that um, uh, Franklin did not foresee the conflict of cultures which would at last destroy even the powerful six nations. Always so far as his imagination saw, there would be a frontier with a forest. And he talks about uh, Van Doren, the Indian's worst enemy was alcohol, which in excess Franklin thought an enemy to anybody. And as between the, the um, Indians and the white settlers, he sympathized with the Indians. It was not they who broke treaties or drove greedy bargains or presumed uh, on superior strength. He believed with William Penn, which is quite interesting because that's who um, uh, Franklin would negotiate with, with the heirs of Penn, that civilized justice and savage justice were much the same and could live side by side in peace. What was needed was an equitable agreement between races and honest trading. This backwoods mission of 1753 was the beginning of Franklin's career in diplomacy. Now, one year after this, in 1754, Benjamin Franklin proposed the Albany Plan of Union, which was to create a unified government for the 13 colonies. Uh, he was then uh, 48 years old. He was a delegate from Pennsylvania at the Albany Conference on the 10th of July, 1754. And it was not going to be successful. When we put our figures from history on a shelf, we tend to think of them as unapproachable, unassailable, but actually Franklin, what I like about him, and as I've said before, is, his approachability as a figure from history, his successes, but also his failures and what he learned from them. And also his uh, foibles, his faults, as well as his incredible achievements. So he was very much a well-rounded person, 
uh, like hopefully the rest of us are in terms of having a balance between our faults and our um, and our positive uh, aspects of our personality. So there's an article by Richard B. Morris um, in who wrote in February 1956 about why this treaty failed. It was a little bit uh, too soon. There was not this feeling that it was necessary that would come much later. And Franklin actually uh, quotes from Dryden uh, in the juvenile satire, where he says, look round the habitable world, uh, how few know their own good or knowing it pursue. So the uh, piece uh, from 1956 that Morris writes um, talks about how uh, one of the richest opportunities um, the study of history affords statesmen, statesmen is the chance to learn from past failures and shaping policy for present realities from the failure to ratify the Albany Plan of Union for which British and American statesmen must share the blame a good deal was salvaged, perhaps more by the Americans than the British, when it came to applying the lessons learned at Albany to setting up their own federal system, the Americans later showed that uh, the experience was by no means wasted. On the other hand, the unwillingness of the British government to set up a truly federal system at a decisive period cost Britain a large slice of her old empire. And eventually Britain did apply the lessons of federalism learned at Albany, but by then America had been irretrievably lost to her. There's a quote that we use in the show, um, the, our historical experience, which comes out of the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, and it could apply very well to the failed Albany plan of union, that history is quoting, is full of the errors of states and princes, and the best measures of statesmanship are seldom adopted from previous uh, wisdom, but by forces um, of occasion. So this was a this was a lesson that that Franklin learned. But it would be the tense of it would be something that um, he would dust off. So I want to um, move to slide three. Um, so. Let's see. Yeah, we can um, here see a picture of uh, of the son of Franklin, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have any. This is the uh, portrait that is most known to us uh, down the down the years. This this uh, painting of of William, but when he came uh, to London with his father in 1757. He was just a young man. He was only 27 years old. And I found a really wonderful letter he wrote from Benjamin Franklin House on the 9th of December to perhaps a girlfriend, Elizabeth Graham. And it, pres it provides some interesting insight into life on Craven Street just months after he and his father's arrival. So even though uh, I'll get to some bit about um, the diplomacy in which his father was engaged, I just couldn't resist sharing this with you. Uh, William wrote, uh, believe me, my dearest Betsy, notwithstanding appearances make against me, I am not wholly without excuse because he was very late in sending this letter because they came in July and he's only writing to his dear Betsy uh, in uh, December, so some months later. Uh, for some time after my arrival at this great metropolis, the infinite variety of new objects the continued noise and bustle in the streets and the viewing such things as were esteemed most curious engrossed all my attention. Since then, frequent engagements amongst politicians, philosophers, and men of business, making acquaintances with such men as have it in their power to be of service in settling our unhappy provincial disputes. More on that I'll say in a moment. Um, he writes, now and then partaking of the public diversions and entertainments of this bewitching country have found full employment for almost every hour. So he's having too much fun. He hasn't been able to write to Betsy. He says, even the present hour is stolen from sleep. 
the watchman's hoarse voice calling, past two o'clock and a cloudy morning. Such is now my hurry and such um, is it like to be rather increasing than diminishing. Ought not then some allowance to be made for my past, nay, for my future? Silence, when so circumstance, but be that as it will, I shall write to you as often as possibly I can and trust to your friendship for an apology. Uh, he goes on to talk about Vauxhall and the pleasure gardens and how amazing they were. Um, he talks about gaiety and brilliancy of the people that he, he met, ravishing music. Um, he says vocal and instrumental. Ah, but then he politics. So um, he says, uh, as politics is a subject you have no great relish for, I shall only mention in general that as yet I see no prospect of a termination of the affairs of my father has undertaken for the province. The little knowledge of, or indeed inclination to know, American affairs among most of those concerned in the administration, their prejudices against the colonies in general, and ours in particular, the many weighty matters they have before them relative to their own affairs in Europe, joined with the obstinacy and wickedness of the proprietors render his task, meaning his father, quote, very uphill and difficult. You will think me justifiable in speaking thus of the proprietors when you consider that during the time they express, express themselves strongly inclined to settle matters amicably with my father, they were repeatedly publishing scandalous and malicious falsehoods against the assembly and the people of Pennsylvania. So um, I thought this was quite interesting um, as a way of describing your exhaustion. At the end of his letter, he says, uh, my eyes began to draw straws. So we'll have to think about what that means, uh, why your eyes would draw straws. And he, and he says, my candle is almost burnt down. So what was his father doing uh, with the pen? So um, he uh, was following, as we heard, um, in the opinion of the Native Americans uh, in the words of Van Doren. But at this point, when he's arriving in 1757, Franklin, and um, until he leaves again in 1762 for a relatively brief period, about 18 months, back to Philadelphia when he thinks he's done all he can with these um, sons of William Penn. He is there to uh, try and get them to pay more to support the um, expenses of the Pennsylvanians who have been providing a bulwark against the French uh, and their Native American allies uh, during the French and Indian War. So he, he wants them to uh, pay up more, but he has a plan in the back of his mind, which would be to have George III, the king, take over Pennsylvania as a royal colony uh, if he could not uh, succeed in his negotiations. For their part, the Pens think that Franklin is no diplomat that they were used to dealing with uh, because he did not know the rules. He was maybe slightly uncouth. They were used to dealing with the other members of the British aristocracy. They, they just found him to be uh, not to their liking. Um, but uh, none, nonetheless, um, he, Franklin, uh, does all that he can um, to convince them, uh, and then he goes back to uh, Pennsylvania. But of course, as we know, there's a lot of talk about taxation, about representation, and when he arrives back in London for the stint that would uh, last until he would leave again in 1775, so over a 10-year period, uh, he is the agent for a number of other colonies, including Massachusetts, Georgia, New Jersey, as well as Pennsylvania, as kind of chief colonial agent. And we believe, um, as uh, with Franklin, as uh, his role as a diplomat, that 36 Craven Street is, in fact, um, the uh, surviving home, the only surviving home of Franklin, but it's also the first de facto American embassy because of the work that Franklin was conducting related to diplomacy. So uh, I want to fast forward to 1775. And uh, Franklin wrote uh, to uh, his son uh, 
in March, the uh, 22nd of March, uh, 1775. So he's on the Pennsylvania packet with a Captain Osborne and he's bound to Philadelphia. So what happened during that period was a tremendous a change in Benjamin Franklin's uh, view of what diplomacy could achieve against the intransigent opinion of the uh, members of parliament, the advisors to the crown, and indeed George III himself. So in this uh, letter, he is um, in this journal, of, it's actually called the Journal of Negotiations in London. He's sending it to his son because he had written to his son in haste. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting as we look at the relationship between uh, Franklin and his son, William, he was illegitimate. Franklin never revealed who William's mother was. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, so good at keeping secrets. Uh, but he was so proud of his son because his son studied at the bar uh, when he came with Franklin um, in the 17, late 1750s uh, to London. And he eventually would become the colonial governor of New Jersey. So at the time that Franklin is writing this, uh, that is the role that William Franklin has. So, so he is a very um, prominent member of the colonial, um, uh, of the colonies and, and among uh, colonial men. So he's writing to his son, he, he wants to tell him about what's been happening. And what you can see in the letters that they exchange is this transition of Franklin, who had been that loyal subject of the king, and a transition also in his son, William. So you, you heard in um, uh, William's messages uh, back uh, home, including that letter to uh, Elizabeth, his uh, friend, that he very much felt hard done by in terms of how the Americans were perceived in London and that their interests were, were not uh, seen as being uh, as fully legitimate as they ought to be, um, that they were being castigated and not understood but the transition that happens for William is that when it comes time to make a decision about what side you are on, are you British or are you American? William decides, of course, to stay loyal to, uh, to the king. But here that is uh, that breach is uh, formulating, but here he's still um, in contact with his son. And uh, he's, he's talking about in these, uh, the summary of the negotiations, the experience that he's had and a lot about the negotiations that he tried to affect in those final days. So using his diplomatic skills, even when he had turned a corner in his own thinking about what he could achieve or what his messages, uh, whether they would fall on fertile ground. There was an incident in uh, prior to uh, 1773, it's called the Hutchinson Affair, where Benjamin Franklin had a crown role. He's postmaster for the colonies and he gets some letters sent to him uh, they are leaked to him, uh, which seems uh, for those of us on uh, the UK side of the Atlantic, very interesting because uh, if you're following uh, the, what's happening in the press, there's been all kinds of supposition about leaked text messages of the prime minister. So you see not much changes probably, but uh, Franklin leaks these letters. Well, they, they, they come to him uh, and basically the letters are of Thomas Hutchinson, who is the royal governor of Massachusetts, who is getting increasingly worried about the unrest with the colonists in and around Boston. And he feels that it might not be unlikely that troops would have to be called and that there's really trouble brewing. So uh, Franklin decides to send these letters without revealing his source to the Sons of Liberty, Samuel Adams and co ask them not to print the letters. They're agitating toward revolution. They print them. Uh, there's a duel in Hyde Park in London. 
uh, between one person who accuses the other of having leaked these letters. So hopefully in the, my more modern story, <laughs> hopefully it won't lead to a duel between the prime minister uh, and uh, anyone else for that matter. But anyway, these two people uh, have their duel and they both live. So it was an unsuccessful duel. And uh, there's a, a fear that they're going to try again to kill one or the other. So Benjamin Franklin on Christmas day of 1773 reveals that he's the source that leaked these letters. These, this whole debacle helps to infuriate uh, certainly the people in Massachusetts. It um, perhaps unwittingly or wittingly leads to the Boston Tea Party because uh, the, there's just so much um, unhappiness with the taxes uh, on, on tea um, and other things and just a uh, feeling that uh, there, there ha change, change has to come. So uh, Franklin uh, says in 1773 uh, on Christmas day in one of the papers, okay, I'm the source. I'm not gonna tell you where I got them, but I'm the person. There's a trial in the House of Commons, which is supposed to be about uh, Thomas Hutchinson and removing him from office, but it really becomes a trial of Benjamin Franklin. And uh, it's something that features quite prominently on our historical experience. And so here in this, um, in this, summary of his negotiations to William Franklin in 1775, as he's on the boat back, um, as the first shots would be fired um, in Lexington and Concord, he says that during the recess, Franklin, um, of the last parliament, which had passed the severe acts against the province of the Massachusetts Bay, the minority having been sensible of their weakness as an effect of their want of union among themselves, began to think seriously of a coalition, for they saw in the violence of these American measures, if persisted in, a hazard of dismembering, weakening, and perhaps ruining the British Empire. I took some pains to promote this disposition in conversations with several of the principals among the minority of both houses. By both houses, he means uh, the, the House of um, uh, the Commons and also the, the House of Lords, so the, the lower house and the upper house, whom I beseeched and conjured most earnestly not to suffer by their little misunderstanding so glorious a fabric to be demolished by these blunderers and for their encouragement assured them as far as my opinions could give any assurance of the firmness and unanimity of America the continuance of, of uh, which was that they had frequent doubts of and appeared extremely apprehensive and anxious concerning it. So he goes on, um, it's a quite long piece um, and he, he's trying to describe all of the things that, that happened. He talks about meeting uh, one of the great um, uh, parliamentarians, Lord Chatham, and uh, the discussions that he had, the engagement that he had with uh, David Barclay. And uh, if we go on, you can see here on slide five, a picture of David Barclay on the left and uh, Dr. Fothergill. John Fothergill had been his great friend, a Scottish physician and Barclay and Fothergill uh, worked with Franklin on a uh, plan for a durable union between Britain and the colonies. And it had a number of things, um, things that would be palatable to the British uh, and things that would be palatable to the Americans. So the fact that the tea that was destroyed in Boston would be paid for, but yet on the other side, that the Tea Duty Act would be repealed and all the duties received would be repaid into the treasuries of the several colonies for which they had been collected, um, that the acts of navigation uh, would be reenacted, um, that a naval officer appointed by the Crown reside in each colony to make sure that the acts of navigation, which preserved the, um, the maritime rights of the colonists would be in, enforced, that all acts that restrain manufacturers in the colonies would be reconsidered, 
Um, no requisitions were made from the colonies in terms of peace, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are 16 points in this plan. So if we go on to the next image here, unfortunately, um, there aren't enough women in positions of leadership in the 18th century, but uh, this is a, a wonderful 19th century rendering of Benjamin Franklin playing chess with Caroline Howe. She's the brother of Lord Howe. And we can go on to the next image. That's Lord Howe there. And um, Lord Howe and his brother are, uh, are distinguished um, members of British society. Um, Lord Howe, uh, this picture here, this Howe is um, going to be a um, naval commander and uh, they, uh, Caroline brokers a meeting between the two of them. Um, and uh, Franklin says that um, uh, she said that her brother wished to be acquainted with me, that he was a very good man and she was sure we should like each other. I said I had always heard a good character of Lord Howe and should be proud of the honor of being known to him. So they, they meet, um, not much comes of it. And it just um, ensues this kind of long saga of Benjamin Franklin, even though the uh, trial that's held um, for the Hutchinson affair, uh, Benjamin Franklin is, uh, is chastised by Alexander Wedderburn, who was the Solicitor General, um, that he was the one who blew up all the coals uh, between Britain and America. There's a, a great uh, quote by, by Wedderburn that we feature in our historical experience. Um, so it's, uh, you know, he very much has begun to turn and think of himself more allied with the American cause, where before he, he saw that if each side gave uh, a bit, that some type of third way could be found. But, but uh, as this period he goes on, he, he's really feeling and seeing that uh, negotiation is, is fruitless. Uh, he meets uh, the, the day, that, so he, he and Howe meet on, the, on Christmas day, uh, 1774, uh, on the 26th uh, Boxing Day, he meets with William Pitt, um, Lord Chatham, who indeed uh, was the uh, former prime minister who was very sympathetic um, to Franklin. And uh, Franklin says, I mentioned to him that no accommodation could properly be proposed and entered into by the Americans while the bayonet was at their breasts. Uh, that to have any agreement binding, all force must be withdrawn. His lordship seemed to think these sentiments had something in them that was reasonable. Uh, on the 1st of February, he goes to Parliament to hear Lord Chatham present a plan, a provisional act for settling the troubles of America and for asserting the supreme legislative authority and superintending power of Great, Great Britain over the colonies. Again, um, you know, Pitt is trying to find that, that way, um, just as in the plan from the previous autumn that Franklin worked on with uh, Father Gill and with Barclay, that, um, that each side can, can give. We can acknowledge that uh, Britain has overstepped its mark in a number of ways with the colonies, but yet um, if in doing so, uh, it will provide cover for the colonists to accept that uh, they are subject to the, uh, to the will of the crown and the authority of the crown. Um, unfortunately, it was um, voted against uh, by uh, Chatham's plan by 61 to 32. So um, here, is a cause, uh, it was an opportunity to avoid bloodshed that was unsuccessful. And the negotiations go on. Um, the next image is of a rather portly Lord North here, who was the prime minister. And um, uh, he actually presents his own resolution on conciliation in the House of Commons. And uh, he talks about how uh, you know, again, that um, the, uh, 
a proposal shall be approved by his majesty in parliament for so long as such provision shall be made accordingly to forbear in the respect of such province or colony to levy any duties. Um, and his resolution surprised a number of his supporters outside of the cabinet, while his opponents in parliament thought that it was insincere, in, in, sincere and insufficient, particularly those that had a great deal of, of sympathy. But, um, but Franklin uh, wrote back, um, to Lord Howe that there was no need to really meet up to talk about Lord North's plan uh, because he said, having nothing to offer on the American business, um, it, it seems most respectful not to give his lordship the trouble of a visit. Um, in, in 20, on the 27th of February, uh, Lord's, uh, Lord North's resolution actually was approved uh, pretty resoundingly, 274 to 88, but it never had a chance of being accepted in the colonies because by the time it reached there, like Benjamin Franklin arriving on the shores of Philadelphia, um, he, uh, back to the, to the Americas, uh, the events of Lexington and Concord were already taking place. So um, I recognize that my time is kind of dwindling. Um, Benjamin Franklin is trying to use his diplomatic skills on a very perilous uh, mission uh, in Canada, um, where you know he really suffers from a terrible uh, cold and uh, just the arduous journey that it must have been to travel by horseback um, to, to Canada. Uh, he also is uh, negotiating again uh, with uh, members of the British um, unsuccessfully. Um, and uh, on the 22nd of uh, October over a period of the 24th of September to the 22nd of October, 1776, the Continental Congress gives instruction to Benjamin Franklin, Silas Dean, and Arthur Lee to um, serve as commissioners to France. Um, and that is their mission, where Benjamin Franklin is uh, asked to to ply his diplomatic wares in getting the, um, the French to uh, support um, the, uh, the cause of the revolution and uh, to give the money that they need um, to give them the diplomatic support. And uh, Benjamin Franklin is uh, very uh, skilled at that. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, how that plays out um, in the Q and A in a minute. Um, but let me just jump uh, forward. There's some really interesting conversations Benjamin Franklin is having with um, his, uh, with, with uh, various British uh, representatives uh, during, the, um, during the years that uh, predate the Treaty of Paris, which ends the Revolutionary War. Um, but uh, he um, eventually is uh, one of the, the key negotiators um, using the skills to try and affect the best kind of uh, um, end to the war that, that can be affected. Um, and of course, there's sort of fascinating tripartite implications of the Treaty of Paris for the United States, for, for uh, Britain, and for France. Um, I found a charming letter about uh, negotiation on negotiation by the Marquis de Lafayette. I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, a place filled with history where Lafayette is very much revered. Um, and you can visit La, um, yeah, a wonderful statue to Lafayette, etc. And uh, Lafayette is offering his services to Benjamin Franklin. And he says um, it is kind of like a negotiation on negotiation where uh, he says, you know, my offer, my zeal, he wants to represent um, the, be uh, part of a uh, commission doing some negotiation uh, uh, with the British. He says, um, my means of serving America, um, you will do what you think consistent with the interest of America and your friendship for me. But I beg the strictest secrecy and expect you will be so kind as to burn uh, immediately this confidential letter. There's some great uh, letters from John Adams, who took a very different approach than Benjamin Franklin uh, to negotiation, which again, we can talk about, but it's a very different spirit that, um, that John Adams has. And uh, you can see um, in the next uh, image that I have here, slide nine, this is a, um, a more 
hopeful looking John Adams than the, the more famous kind of dour looking portrait of him, but his words are nonetheless kind of convey his personality. So in 1781, um, uh, before the end of the war in 1783, he's saying, I'm very apprehensive that our new commission will be as useless as my old one. Congress may very safely, I believe, permit us all to go home if we had no other business and stay there some years, at least until every British soldier in the United States is killed or captivated. Till then, Britain will never think of peace, but for the purpose of chicanery. So uh, Adams definitely uh, takes a different view than Franklin, who uh, is sometimes pessimistic, but very much um, uh, uh, optimistic. And uh, it's not clear from uh, a letter that John Adams sends to Benjamin Franklin, uh, this one that I'm mentioning from Amsterdam, where he's serving as the ambassador there on the 25th of August, 1781, because he's also translating a, a letter from the Empress of Russia, uh, but it could so well apply to um, Adams at this period that my talent, if I have one, lies in making war. So here's, I'm gonna just close uh, with a wonderful letter from Jonathan Shipley. Um, uh, Jonathan Shipley was Franklin's great friend. He was the Bishop of St. Asaph in Twyford um, in the countryside uh, of England. And Franklin had written the first part of his autobiography there. And so this is on the 27th of November, uh, 1785. Franklin has uh, finished all the, the work of the Treaty of Paris. And he has uh, gone back to England uh, just stopping in Southampton, uh, his boat on the way to go back to uh, Pennsylvania. And he says, uh, Jonathan Shipley to Franklin, my dear friend, uh, I felt myself much obliged uh, to you. Um, and he goes on to say that um, it was very busy uh, before, uh, when, when uh, Shipley was uh, seeing Franklin uh, in Southampton, he says, our last short interview at Southampton was so much in mixed company and yours, ours were so entirely taken up with the final business of leaving this ungrateful country that I hardly found a single opportunity for the confidential information to which our old friendship seemed to entitle us. And I, on my part, was very ready to give. But to own the truth, I had but little curiosity to know the particulars of your negotiations with either the French or the English ministers. The event has shown that in their own arts, you were not inferior to the ablest of them. So I think I'll close there. I know we don't have a lot of time for Q&A because I've talked too much, but, um, uh, and then maybe we can just go to the last image, Caitlin. This is Benjamin Franklin, this unfinished uh, portrait of the Treaty of Paris and going on. Uh, Benjamin Franklin surrounded by Jefferson and Adams and Washington. Um, oh, this is uh, Jonathan Shipley. Oops, that's Jonathan Shipley. His uh, friend who wrote that uh, lovely letter. And then this uh, Mason Chamberlain uh, picture of Benjamin Franklin from 1762, which I really like uh, with his electric bells and stuff happening in the background beyond the curtain, uh, which was uh, probably might have been posed for uh, even at Craven Street. So I'll stop there. And if there are any questions, I'd uh, be happy to answer them if I can or hear your views. Great, thank you very much, Marcy. We do actually have a couple of questions already. Um, so the first one we have it is, it sounds as though Franklin became a diplomat almost by accident based on whom he knew and what he had accomplished during his life. Was this typical for the time or was there a professional career for diplomats during Franklin's time? Um, yeah, so, um, you know, today, um, you, you, if you want to be um, a diplomat, uh, you say in France, and we are very fortunate to have uh, two diplomats uh, serve on our board, Ambassador Gerard Herrera, who uh, represented the French uh, foreign ministry and also was a uh, former uh, French ambassador to the United Kingdom and also Irina Bakova, who was the first uh, woman to head UNESCO um, and represented um, uh, the government of Bulgaria um, as, a, as a diplomat. 
in a number of uh, ways. And, and uh, if you are uh, want in, you're in France and you want to uh, become a diplomat, there's a school that you go to, the School of Administration, and um, you will learn the, the, um, the background and the history and, and hopefully a number of skills. Uh, but actually, you know, Benjamin Franklin, not formally taught, he has to learn as he goes on the job. But going back to what I was saying at the beginning, I think he had a temperament that was very uh, well predisposed to listening, being a good listener, and then looking for solutions. And I, I said I'd come back a little bit to um, the uh, engagement as the representative to France of uh, Franklin um, and Adams having a completely different view of diplomacy where you know um, Adams, we might say, is about the, the the stick, and Franklin is about the carrot. So he's uh, getting up late. He's um, uh, hanging around in the salons um, of the French court, and actually, he's getting he's uh, building friendships. He's meeting the right people, and he's using his charm, his wit, his intelligence to uh, um, have the diplomatic, positive diplomatic effect that uh, would convince the French to pay not an inconsiderable sum to support the revolution, without which I don't know if the Americans would have been successful in their cause. Uh, and the next question that we have, I mean, I think you sort of addressed it, but do we know whether he was equally eloquent on his feet as he was in his writing when called upon to negotiate or be diplomatic in person? <laughs> uh, well, he seems he seems to be. There's, a, there's quite a, um, there's quite a bit of um, uh, writing that he does, um, you know, where he's kind of relaying or other people are relaying about, um, you know, things that he said. So I found, for example, this letter by one Sir Philip Gibbs. It's a minutes of a conversation with Franklin. It's in the Yale University Library. Um, it's uh, uh, January 5th, 1778. So kind of um, earlier days of the revolution. And uh, this is what I meant before is that um, certainly in my mind, uh, it was that um, there's a war and then nobody talked to each other, but actually they talked with uh, their, they talked with various counterparts um, all the time. It just didn't really um, have the, the right effect. Um, but this was a time when communication was slow and, uh, and it was hard to get kind of a, a joined up vision. But um, this uh, Sir Philip, is uh, talking about things that Franklin said and supposing, uh, supposedly quoting him. Um, so he says that Franklin said, uh, I am of the opinion, sir, it would, do, uh, it would do harm to communicate, even as a matter of private conversation, the expectations of America. Great Britain is making preparations for a vigorous campaign with the idea of enforcing submission. While she entertains that hope, the terms which America may think just and reasonable, she may call insolent. Proposals from America, intimated even in the manner you suggest, might be supposed to arise from apprehension and might obstruct the ends you seem desirous to promote. Well, that seems pretty eloquent to me. So if that was a, um, that was a accurate uh, representation of what Franklin said, maybe he was just as eloquent in uh, private as he was uh, with his writing. Um, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, so we have from Alice Hopkinson, um, who just submitted their undergrad dissertation and spoke about Franklin's role as the bringer of the Enlightenment to America. Um, so she would like to say his role as a diplomat is greater, um, would you say his role as a diplomat is greater or more important than his role as the bridge between the old world of Europe and the new world of America? I, um, I, I don't think I would say, um, I would say and rather than uh, either. I, I think it really uh, is equally important uh, that, and so much of his sens sensibility um, as someone that remained even if, um, even if there was a war of separation, who remained very much a kind of transatlantic character. And why did he spend so long in London? Why this kind of better part of 16 years um, over that period between 1757 and 1762, and then again 
1764 to 1775. I think it was because he um, was fascinated by the ideas that he could share and that he learned from uh, other figures of the Enlightenment with which he engaged, uh, members of the Lunar Society like Erasmus Darwin or Josiah Wedgwood um, or James Watt, um, so uh, Matthew Bolton, etc. So it was a very rich uh, time in his life. And in fact, um, as I mentioned in that kind of Bible of uh, Carl Van Doren, the, I think um, and it's very dear to my heart uh, being involved with um, having the privilege of being involved with Benjamin Franklin House, um, that the largest section of that book is the period of Franklin's life in London. So I think it's a bit of, uh, of a mix. Uh, he, could, he could definitely tap into his colonial down home uh, image and he kind of used that very wisely in his negotiations with the French, you know, who might've, he might've caught his, his brilliance you know, he, he actually was a, a fluent in French, uh, you know, he's self-taught, um, but he would uh, go out with, a, um, you know, a, a raccoon's hat on his head. And, you know, he must have been quite a sight, you know, when people were, you know, especially the women um, in the French court, you know, had these huge wigs. And um, so they kind of took him on his own merit, but uh, he... He was able, I think, to, to bridge both worlds very well and, um, and, and both really factored and influenced his life. Well, thank you very much, Marcia, for the uh, interesting presentation. Um, and thank you very much for all of you who joined us today. Um, if you like that Mason Chamberlain portrait, it's actually in our Franklin and Portraits exhibition that's on the Bloomberg Connects app. Um, and we are doing uh, talks and events with our historians on each of them. So please do uh, follow us. We'll download the guide, the free guide to find out more about that. Um, and our next talk will actually be on the 17th of May. And it's from um, Jim M. Buskey, who is the digital historian for uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon. So, um, and uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us. And this is recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again, you can, um, you can see it on our website or on our YouTube channel. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you.